Hi everybody, Greg Roark here, Director of STEM Education at Redbird Flight Simulations. And today what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through uh, an opportunity, I think, at most flight schools uh, around the country, and certainly those, uh, those customers of ours that have, that have uh, noticed some of the things that we've been doing with education. And as the title of this implies here, STEM in the flight school, well, you know, what in the world, uh, why, why would that matter at all? Well, let's take a look at this here just real quick. First of all, I just want to say that I'm making a presumption. That presumption comes in the form of the knowledge of what STEM is anyway. So there are going to be those of you that are watching this that are either, hey, I already understand what STEM is and I'm already working with my local school district with a program there, which is awesome. And if you are, I'd love to hear uh, from you uh, because of the fact that, that you have lessons that you have learned that we could share with others to, to help them grow also. But then I also know that there may be people that possibly don't know what's involved with STEM and the connection between STEM and aeronautics. And so that's part of this that I want to go over with you. So there will be some background that I share with you and some of that you folks already may be completely up to speed with that and I respect that. But then you, we also have to understand that perhaps there are those that may not be. So with that, that's what, uh, what we're going to be looking at here uh, today. As we do, <clears throat> We're going to be looking at the question about what is STEM and why in the name of Orville and Wilbur should I care? So when we look at this, absolutely, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This has been something that's been around, the, the, actual, uh, the actual acronym of this has been around for, for decades. Uh, it did not start out as STEM. In fact, it started out as SMET. But, uh, but someone along the way thought that SMET was probably not the best marketing tool for some educational programming. So they rearranged the letters slightly and came up with STEM. So with that, the goal there with STEM has been working with young people to help them not just improve test scores, because that was just an indicator that we as a nation had a problem, but it was also the recognition that there were employment opportunities in the future that if we did not help our young people uh, acquire the skills necessary to take those jobs, that there would be jobs left unfilled in this nation. More about that here in just a second. So we look at that and we also say, are the students getting enough? Are they getting enough STEM? We could argue that all day long. There are some schools now that have made a big impact in that STEM type education. Uh, there are some schools, uh, uh, particularly charter schools that have started that are all about STEM and that's their focus. Other more traditional public schools have been trying to work STEM educational programming within their existing curricular architecture to make all of that work, some with various degrees of success. So the, 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 the programming element of this <clears throat> is that part that we say, are kids getting enough? Well, they may be getting enough, but What's the, what, to what ends? What is it that we're looking for here when we get to STEM educational programming? Because we can look at the theory of STEM and to say, okay, this is great. And we can look at a theory of a particular subject and say, this is wonderful, but how do you apply it? That's where STEM truly comes into play uh, with kids in learning what a particular thing can do with regard to their lives going forward. And when they can see something that's applied in a certain area, now it has much more impact on that student, much more relevance. And once something has relevance, the chances of that being used again in some meaningful way with a student is logarithmically improved. So that's one of the things that we need to look at there. And the biggest thing here is to ask, so what? What's the end game here with STEM? Well, with STEM, we have to look at another acronym called the J-O-B. 
Remember those jobs that I was telling you about that were forecast to go unfilled uh, way back in the day? Well, guess what? This past year, according to statistics, and I don't have to tell you about statistics, but according to statistics, two and a half million high-tech jobs in that STEM sector are unfilled in this country. Why? Well, because one is that there's a limitation on the certain types of visas that foreign workers can come into the United States and take those jobs, but primarily it's because we are not training people in those areas to give them the skills necessary to accept those jobs. These are high pay, high reward career jobs. And those are the things there where I think you can see my soapbox here uh, as far as, as what I believe passionately about and about guiding students toward those types of careers. Not to, to suggest that humanities are not important because they absolutely are. But those jobs and that type of, of career potential for students across this country, it's too meaningful to ignore. So with that, we look at this. Where does aeronautics enter that equation? <clears throat> and when we look at aeronautics, the big thing is, is that aeronautics is STEM. Everything about aeronautics, and when we think about this with regard to flight schools and with regard to teaching people how to fly, which is a component of STEM, it's not everything, but it's a, it's a, it's a big component of it, virtually everything in aeronautics is STEM. So I look at this and thinking in terms of aeronautics being the ultimate STEM education. It truly is because there is nothing else that a student will go through throughout their day in school that cannot be applied in or around that airplane that you're using to teach people how to fly. So it's a perfect dot to connect when it comes to STEM education. The next thing is we look at this and we think about where STEM is with regard to academia, etc. So those of you that have seen any or read any of the articles that I've written or, or any of the other videos understand that where I sit on edubabble. But I do think that there is a place for this if we're using those terms toward an end. What are those outcomes-based elements that we can use to guide a student toward? For instance, the big things now, project-based, hands-on uh, uh, projects for students, those are big deals. Well, nothing like getting your hands on an airplane, right? Well, what about critical thinking? Here's a thought. You're at 12,500 feet and all of a sudden you go into stealth mode may require a little critical thinking, right? What about those things where we talk about 21st century learning? What does that mean? 21st century learning comes into play when we think about that J-O-B and what is it we're actually teaching students to actually know or do. When we think about that, a lot of times, what with regard to what we're teaching is perhaps less important in the fact of thinking about how that student learns that particular subject. Because once a student understands how they learn, they're going to have to rely on those skills with 21st century learning because guys, face it, we are teaching young people right now to take jobs in career fields that haven't even been invented yet. So how are they going to learn? How are they going to take something like, for instance, all of the information necessary to become a private pilot, all of that information, how do they assimilate all of that information in some meaningful way to actually then be able to use it towards something, and again, in this case, towards something that may be the J-O-B, or a better understanding of the world around them. So that is that thing where we think about the end game and we think about where we are and what all of that edubabble means. It becomes actually living when we look at the application of all of this, uh, of this academia with regard to aeronautics. So 
as we look here again, we think about also our future generation. That future generation, what type of country are we building? Where is it that we think that this country it needs people like we produce with regards to aeronautics education? I think that we know the answer to that question. Also, we can look at this. How about this? How about becoming a pilot? Do you think that might involve some form of technology or other, perhaps, you know, as you look out there and just see what might be available? Well, as we look at certain things like this, do you suppose there might be some technology involved here? And we're looking here at the pointy end of an Airbus A380. Yep, there's some technology involved. And by the way, the left seat up there, uh, do you think that's some pretty good career potential as far as uh, earning potential with something like that? Even the right seat of an airplane like this. So there's one part about that, about becoming a pilot, is, is the payoff. Not only is it an amazing thing to do, but it can also be financially rewarding for those students who are willing to, to, to sacrifice, pay their dues, and continue learning this is what you can get to do down the road. So with that, also, we want to look at this. What does that mean to have a leg up on the competition? And this is something too that, uh, that sometimes isn't really being taught in the schools is that competitive element. So <clears throat> part of this has to do with the fact that at some point, you may either go to, whether it's a trade school or a four-year university or college, some form of post-secondary education with that. Are some of these institutions competitive? In other words, they don't just accept everybody, do they? Well, what is it that they require for admission? Well, most of them, you've got to have good grades. Well, again, people are talking about 385 as being sort of that threshold there about whether most schools will look at that student. Well, now you have to look at that, and with a lot of them, I'll be honest, 385, yawn. Okay, everybody comes in with a 385. What else you got? So with that, students also have to show, well, here are some of the other things that I have done in my community. Okay, that's great. You worked at a soup kitchen. Not that that's, that's not important, but everybody does that. What else have you done? What else have you done to show initiative and to be able to accept some challenging goal and actually achieve it? How about this? How about becoming a pilot? Put that on that resume and let's see which stack that application goes in. Does it go in over here with all of the others? Or does it go in over here with a special pile, at least where they want to talk to this person? It's a door opener. And that's that leg up that becoming a pilot in high school can give a student over their competition. And make no mistake, there is competition. And that does exist. With that, here's something else that can help you get a little bit, uh, little bit ahead of the curve. So, enough altruism. We have to look at the opportunities that we have for a local flight school. Well, first of all, it's that understanding where you are in your community. Most of your flight schools here are definitely part of your community and you've worked hard to become so, and that's tremendous. So there's no reason at all why you're not already educating some of these students that I'm talking about. There may be that odd student here or there, not that that student is odd, but it's that part where you have one or two perhaps that may be part of your flight school, but not necessarily in any true organized fashion. So they may already be there. Uh, and in fact, what they're looking for, it's that payoff in that pathway. And it's going to be those students there who have uh, uh, exercised a particular type of initiative to say, yes, this is something that I want to do and has perhaps sought outside means to be able to make that happen. So those students exist and you probably see them. But there's another part of this too, is that business part with regard to a flight school. It's okay to think about the business element while you're also thinking about the altruism. Is it a bad thing to think about doing something here that we know is good for students, good for our community, good for our future over here, but where also it's also good for business? Win-win. So it's also a good thing in that regard. 
when we look at this, there are some deeper considerations that you have when we're when you're thinking about looking at becoming more involved in your local community, your local school, about being able to put together some form of an aeronautics program that can lead students there in your local community to the promised land of becoming a private pilot, private pilot with an instrument rating perhaps. So some of those deeper considerations are the fact that as you begin doing this, it's work. It takes a while to be able to do this. And you also have to think, okay, where does somebody even start with that? Great question. Once you choose to get involved in this, these are some of the big questions that you would ask. Where would you even start? Who should be at the table when you're having conversations along these lines? We talked about the community. Well, in the community, you obviously have the school itself, so administration is going to need to be involved, whether that's at the superintendent level of the school, a board member of the school, whether that be a principal, or it could also even begin with an instructor at that school, whether it's middle or high school, that may be a champion of your program, that might also be able to put together people to have that meeting to be able to say, Guys, would you be interested in this? So those are some of the things that you need to, to consider about who needs to be there from the, the education side of the house. Also, students and parents. And also, always, always, always include the parents in those also. And the reason that you include the parents is because, again, I don't have to tell you that in some cases you're dealing with minors here when it comes to instruction, but you'd also be surprised at the number of parents that ultimately take interest in learning how to fly once Junior is out there learning how to fly fly. So a little ancillary benefit there uh, as well. So other people to be at that table, we talked about community. Well, what about the mayor of your, of your community? What about business leaders, especially business leaders that may be found at or near that airport that understand what aviation means to that community and the economic benefits that that community gleans from aviation uh, they're on site. So business leaders, parents, students, school, administrators, teachers, champions for your program, those are some people who should be at that table when you start having those conversations. And then you think, okay, what will these conversations be like? What is it that they want to know? Education-wise, what is it that the people in education are going to want to know? Well, they want to know First of all, what is at the end of this STEM rainbow that you're talking about here? What can the students look forward to receiving? Will there be some form of STEM industry certification involved for students who may participate in this program? The answer to that question is absolutely. Because at the end of this, even if a student chooses not to actually fly, taking that written knowledge exam, what do you get there? You get a piece of paper saying that you have taken and passed an FAA written knowledge exam with regards to being a private pilot. Industry certification. And that's the litmus test of what a true STEM education program can be. And that's just the first step. What about that instrument rating? There's no reason that that 17 year old student cannot also become an instrument rated pilot. Well, there's two. Two forms of industry certification. Also, Will there be high school credit involved? This is a question that you have to ask. In most cases, in the transportation sector, there is room within that CTE, Career Tech Ed, at that particular school that recognizes transportation as part of that and makes it eligible for it to be an elective at that school. So with that, that becomes an elective now that a student can choose so they get high school credit for it. But here's the other cool part. Most universities that offer some form of aeronautics or aviation program will also offer that student credit for becoming a private pilot also. So there can be college hours involved in this also. So a lot of benefits here for the student. Plus, from an educational standpoint, it's a nice feather in the cap for, uh, for educators there because guess what? They are also part of this community. So again, we're all trying to build the community, all trying to do what's right for everyone who lives there. And in this case, it's going to be the students. So there's one thought there as well. 
And then there's also the conversations that you think about with regard to the community, you think about business. Well, let's say that you have some high tech sector uh, business that may be there on the airfield or, or nearby. Do you think perhaps partnering with that institution to offer internships, preceptorships, uh, or perhaps even potential employment opportunities for students who go through this program in that field. There could be an avionics manufacturer that could also be there nearby who is starving for students who have the types of skills and initiative to be able to move that company forward and to, to compete on a global marketplace. So the businesses, industry there within your community also are going to be keenly interested in the type of student that you're building here through this, this aeronautics programming through your flight school. We look at, dis at success and to say, okay, what is that? Certain types of success could be this. At the end of this, we're gonna have private pilots. And that's awesome, that's great. Well, it could also be, yes, we'll start with private pilots, but you know what, there's no reason why that we cannot have instrument rated pilots also at the end of this thing. Or how about this? What about commercial certification? Why can't we do that? Why can't we offer those? It's going to be the type of thing that when you begin this process and you think about what's possible, what's out there, there's a lot of things that are possible. Even if you start with a relatively narrow scope, having those other elements on your big board out there will serve you well because here's the thing that I can tell you in my decade plus of building programming like this at school districts across this great land of ours is that the, the place where people, I don't wanna say get in trouble because it's actually good trouble, but the places where people have underestimated the impact of beginning programming at, at school districts like this is the what's next you start this ball rolling and the challenge then becomes staying ahead of it because these students are going to be absolutely on fire once they see what the opportunity is for them to do something amazing and as they understand the, the educational and career potential through programming like this. So that's been the biggest challenge with people is to say, what's next? So staying ahead of that is crucial. As we look here and we think about, all right, we're at Redbird, how can we help? So as we look at this, our personnel uh, at Redbird, I'm relatively new to this position here, but my purpose of being with Redbird is to help people like yourselves with creating programming educationally about STEM education and about how we can use aeronautics to preach the gospel of aeronautics education. I have been doing this for a while. I've got a couple of degrees in education. I've got a fistful of, uh, of certificates and ratings here also. And every morning when my feet hit the floor, I am truly grateful and thankful for getting to do what I get to do, which is to help people like you introduce students into an amazing career potential, which is aeronautics. So we have people here at Redbird that can help you out. Also, we have some experience, experience that I just mentioned there before. I'm not suggesting that I am the god of all things aeronautics or education at all, but working together, we can come up with some pretty amazing solutions that are right for you. Also, we look at some of the tools that we have. Uh, as most of you know, we are developing more and more educational tools here, uh, especially for those of you that use our simulations, uh, that you'll see this educational piece that, that helps put these things together actually in schools for you. Uh, also the support that we have, and it's not just product support, but it's also educational support, and it's also programming support where we can help you build that type of program that, that is right for you, your business, your community, and your students. Uh, when we look at exploring this possibility, what is all involved with this? Well, suffice it to say that, that we're here, we're standing by, we're ready to have these conversations with you to help you along these, these lines if you're so interested. And you can contact us here for that personal conversation about your particular situation. 
You can contact me, Greg Roark. There's my email address. You can also talk with Joey Colloran. She's amazing. She is our Director of Customer Success. Uh, there's her email there as well. Even our sales department also, um, which most of, you, uh, most of you know there as well, uh, they can also help get a conversation started, get us involved, and we can start talking about ways for you to be able to make these things happen. And so with that, <clears throat> I would just like to thank you for your time, and I appreciate you listening here to me. Uh, should you have questions, should you think, okay, I'd like to know a little bit more, please, as the slides indicated there, call anytime, send an email, and be happy to talk to you. So, uh, thanks for tuning in here in Migration 2020, and I uh, look forward to seeing you down the road. Take good care.